Welcome to the March edition of our Journal of Statistics Education and Data, sorry, Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education webinar series. Um, I'm going to briefly, let me share my screen here and we'll kind of go through some introductory things. I hope everybody's doing well. I'm having some spring allergy. Spring is here, but <laughs> the allergies are trying to get me. Um, anyway, all right. So today we're going to talk about four interactive arcade games to teach statistics. Um, we'll do a little introduction of Jacopo here in just a minute. Um, I'm Lee Johnson, if you don't know, uh, from Capital University, and I just sort of host and moderate this. Um, so a couple of things. The journal, of course, this is a webinar series for the journal. A couple of recent articles that just came out this week. You can see uh, the dates. So there was a new article to look at medical statistics software using a flipped classroom. So that looked pretty interesting. Uh, there was a, um, the title's Implementing a Simple, Scalable, Self-Regulated Learning Intervention to Promote Graduate Learners' Statistics Self-Efficacy and Concept Knowledge. That also came out in the last week, uh, research article. And um, the last one, Integrating Data Science Ethics, um, well, I, know, I know a lot of us are working on trying to integrate ethics into our undergraduate data science courses, so this would be a great article for you if you haven't seen it. All right, a um, little advertisement for our webinar next month, um, building a multiple linear regression model with Lego brick data. Um, we will have an advertisement and registration for that available soon, but as always, you go to the webinars page for cause and you can sign up there. We'll have more information on that coming very soon. Um, reminder that ECOTS is coming up here in a couple of months. Um, if you go to the website, which I have here, um, you cannot register yet. It says registration is coming soon. I'm sure that's going to happen within the next few weeks. Uh, the keynote talks are listed, so you can kind of get a little preview of some of the keynotes. Uh, the rest of the program will be up shortly. Oh, sorry, that is not working. I skipped over a slide, sorry about that. Um, and then of course, just a quick reminder as you're doing your winter and spring courses, if you have student projects that might be good for the undergraduate statistics project competition, the deadline for submission is June 24th. Got a little time on that, but it's always good to be thinking about these things um, as the semester's going along. All right, and now uh, introduction to Jacopo <laughs> Diorio, which I am probably just butchering terribly. I, I did work on it a little bit, but um, is a postdoctoral Eberly Fellow at the Department of Statistics at Penn State in State College. Um, previously a postdoctoral research fellow at Sco. Okay, I'm gonna have to have you pronounce the name of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. Sounds much better when you do it. Um, <laughs> he's a in 2020, he got his PhD in mathematical models and methods and engineering um, from Polocinico de Milano. Okay, yes. Sorry. His research interests lie primarily in the field of clustering and by clustering for multivariate and functional data, applied statistics and statistics and data science education. So just very briefly here, we're gonna switch sharing screens so that he okay. can share his slides. And I will let you take it away. <laughs> okay, Oops, sounds fine. So let me let me use the full screen. I believe it's. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, so if you just hit slideshow, I believe it goes full screen. What is slideshow? Over on the right, next to. I okay. It was covered by the. <laughs> Yeah, zoom, I have that problem too. <laughs> object. So thank you very much for being here. I'm Jacopo Di Diori. I'm very happy today to talk about uh, our uh, um, projects uh, for interactive arcade games to teach statistics. We decided uh, this project started back in uh, 2018 uh, when we had to teach uh, in uh, Politecnico di Milano statistics uh, to a class uh, of uh, master students in communication design interested in data visualization. And uh, we had to teach uh, a very 
short brief course, uh, just 30 hours, uh, about uh, many different statistical topics, from the basic of statistics uh, and basic of data science, uh, the concept of mean, variance, standard deviation, uh, the concept of uh, data metrics, uh, to more advanced topics, such as clustering, principal component analysis, uh, and linear regression. We wanted to teach also this more advanced topic because we knew that our students uh, in the future, they were meant to use data visualization to represent uh, maybe results uh, of techniques uh, that are more advanced. So we wanted to help them and to give them some uh, elements uh, about uh, even more advanced statistical topics. The main issue about teaching this course was given by the fact that even if they were master students, they were master students in communication design. And uh, the majority of our students came from a background that was not really focused on mathematical or statistical reasoning. Let's think about that the majority of our students studied uh, a bachelor in uh, communication design, of course, or uh, paintings, or even uh, uh, fashion design. All bachelors where maths is not the main topic. So the main problem when teaching this class was given by the fact that our students were affected by the so-called math phobia. That is a negative attitude toward uh, mathematical disciplines. Our students were afraid of uh, watching uh, a formula, a mathematical formula written on the blackboard, uh, and they were uh, affected by a lack of interest uh, in everything that was connected with mathematics, even if they wanted to become experts in data visualization. So we had to find out a way to teach statistics uh, without uh, making our students afraid of statistics. And the first idea, being a very huge fan of video games, was creating four interactive arcade video games that we could use to teach the main topics of our class. So these are our four interactive arcade games. These are the titles. Every title is quoting uh, an arcade video games, an old arcade video games. And uh, every game is about uh, one different topic. So we had four different arcade games, uh, but four different experiences uh, that were created uh, having uh, in mind uh, a general uh, and common idea. So the users were playing for different games, one at a time, one for each topic, but the general idea, the general framework uh, were the same. So all the games uh, were sharing uh, the same general characteristics that are the following one. They were user-centric, score-based, and interactive and touch-friendly. When we say user-centric, it means that our games were created in order to work with data that were collected in class by our students. In this way, even if they were not very interested, maybe in the statistical topic, they were interested in the results they could get uh, using their statistical topics uh, on the data that they collected in class. So we decided to spend some time collecting the data and we used the data that we collected in class on a topic that was interesting for our students uh, in the games. Another, inter another element uh, is that the games uh, are all uh, score-based. So the players uh, have to minimize uh, a statistical performance uh, score a statistical performance score that has a geometrical meaning, easy to understand even if you, don't if you don't know anything about statistics, but also a statistical meaning. A statistical meaning that is revealed by the instructors at the end of the experience with the game and the topic we were covering. Being score-based means that our games were arcade because we, allowed students to compare their score. And we also create a leaderboard. And the most competitive students wanted to be at the top of our leaderboard. 
to be the best of the best in the minimization of the score, even if they were playing in reality with statistics. Also, how to allow students to interact with our games? There are many different ways to allow the interaction. The first idea was based on using the sliders and formulas. They were very precise, but they were not user-friendly at all because a slider and a formula is not user-friendly for people that are affected to math phobia and don't like formulas. So we decided to demand all the interaction to clicking and touching. And this is, was a smart idea, especially because we are living the age of uh, smartphones. Uh, we are living the age of uh, touching devices. So the only thing that you need to play your game is touching a plot, okay? So let's, I'm going to show you one game. I'm not going to show you the four game because we don't have enough time, but you can check them on the, the paper. So this is the game that I'm going to show you. It's the Point Black Revolution game. That is the game about clustering. Before uh, show you, showing you the game, I want to give you some general idea about the class experience. How can I repeat this experience in my class? First of all, you need to be sure that your class has the following theoretical prerequisites that are very easy. The concept of Euclidean distance, that is a very natural concept that maybe also kids can understand. And the concept of Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem is a little bit harder. So maybe if you want to try this game with very, very young students, be careful when you deal with Pythagorean theorem. After that, if you want to make the experience user-centric, if you want to allow the students to play with games, with data that, you, that they collected in class, you need to organize a class where you collect the data with your student. In our case, we spend one class collecting the data uh, about a topic that was interesting to our student. Students are communication design students, so they were interested in social media. So we collected with a survey information about the number of Instagram followers and uh, Facebook friends they have. We collected this data in a data matrix and we pre-processed the data matrix. The pre-processing is a nice moment to explain to the class the importance of pre-processing. The fact that the data structure in a matrix sometimes, the difference between futures, observation, and so on. And also the importance to clean your data before using them in a project. In this case, we are not using them for performing a data analysis, but we are using them in the game. So I'm going to show you the game. I don't know if you can see the, the page. This is the Point Black Revolution game. You can see that the, it's very minimal. You can uh, start playing with the game that are already uploaded here, or you can also upload your own data set. And in this case, uh, the students were asked to interact with the plot by clicking on it. Every click generates a different red points. When you are ready, you click the button ready, and you can see that all the black points, all the data points are connected to the close red points that the user selected, okay? You can reset the plot using the command reset. And you can also decide to use more red points, okay? The aim of this game was fix a number of points, so for this, in this case, five red points, minimize the score that is written here. All the score were then collected in class, and then they were showed in a leaderboard. At the end of the experience, at the end of the experience, we uh, we talked together in class. The instructors and the students are talking together about what happened during the game. So, what is the score? The score in this case is the distance uh, is connected to the distance between every single black points and the red points. Of course, but what does it mean statistically? The score is the total within cluster sum of square. 
a concept that you use uh, to identify the goodness uh, of your cluster object, okay? So all these concepts are concepts that are unknown to the player, but playing with this game, the players start to understand this concept. Of course, understanding without knowing the real meaning of this concept. And then the instructor needs to use this experience to help the student to understand the statistical reasoning behind the score and behind the game. Every game is then connected with the other. They are not connected only because they have the same structure. They can also be connected with the others because they are similar in some sense. In this case, this game is similar to the main game. The main game was very similar, just uh, the only difference is that you need to identify one single point and that single point is the mean. Okay, so if you play this game with one single red point, you were playing in reality the game about mean and standard deviation, mean and variance. And many students that played the game about mean and variance and remembered the experience with the game were able to understand that when you just select one point, you were just doing the same thing of the previous game. Okay. So, of course, in the paper, you're going to find the other games and you're also going to find some alternatives that you can use in class. For instance, in the case of linear regression, you have a lot of different alternatives. But if you consider the problem like principal component analysis, you don't have so many alternatives. For instance, to the best of my knowledge, the only two games about principal component analysis that are available online are games that are based on formula and sliders, so they're not user-friendly, and they are in Portuguese, okay? And they are available on GeoZebra. So in the case, for instance, of principal component analysis, our game is one of the best alternatives because you don't have so many alternatives. So we had a quick question. OK. Um, can you click a button to see the optimal centers if like your cluster k equals 3 or k equals 5? That way you can see how close you were to the best clusters? No, you cannot in this version. You, are not, you cannot because we wanted to um, let the let the, the student play and have a leaderboard if we show the results uh, there's no competition at all but at the end of the experience the instructor is using this a statistical method to show to the class the optimal result so at the end is the instructor that needs to show to the class the optimal result of course this was a decision that we made according to the kind of experience that we want to create. It could be also interesting to create an app that uh, already gives you the solution. In this case, uh, we are going to lose uh, the, all, the all the competitive uh, uh, framework that we created. Okay, so let's go to the conclusion in this, um, in this paper, we created four experience. Uh, uh, that are meant to be played under the supervision of uh, an instructor, okay? These experiences require very basic theoretical background, for instance, the concept of distance and the uh, Pythagorean theorem for some uh, games. And uh, they are based on a mix of interactive visualization and uh, touching dynamics. They can be played as a user-centric experience, so an experience that is based on the data collected in class, data that are interesting to the students. And they are arcade in the sense that the players is required to minimize a score that has a geometrical and also a statistical meaning. And these scores can be structured in a leaderboard and we can also uh, decide who is the winner inside the class, the guys or the girls that uh, reach the minimum score. Okay, these games are suitable for a wide range of students. We use with the communication designer, but I'm still using here while I'm teaching at Penn State University on a data science course. The only difference is the framework that you create around these games. Okay. Also, what I want to do next, what I would like to do next is trying to enlarge the user base, reaching for instance kids. 
However, as you've seen, the games that I proposed before are not very, um, you know, fascinating for kids. They are not very funny. So we want to create uh, another version of this game so, or a new uh, set of games so that are um, a more playable experience. The first try that I attended uh, is this game here, All Mean Cats Just Want to Have Fun. That is a game where the Cartesian axis was replaced with this green field here, and the data points were replaced with cats. The main goal of this game was to identify the position where uh, uh, to shot uh, fireworks. Okay, so you need to find the optimal position to shot your fireworks in order to make all the cats happy. And the optimal position is uh, the mean position considering the position of the cats. This game was introduced and presented for the first time at the Meet Me Tonight 2019, that is the European Night of Researchers, to an audience based principally by kids going from age six to 12. Okay, so we had our first experience with a a real video game, a video game, uh, an experience that looked like a video game totally without any element that reminds you about mathematics or statistics differently from the game that I introduced you before. So thank you very much for your attention. You can find uh, the paper here and in the supplementary of the paper, uh, you can find uh, all the links uh, for the four interactive games that I introduced you today. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are any question. Yeah, there was a question. Is there an assessment that you do that's attached to each game? Or did... No, I did not do any assessment for the moment, but uh, I used the game in class. Precisely, I used the game um, in class connected with some uh, Auto, uh, for some survey, class survey like Top Hat or this app here that we use in class to communicate, uh, to launch quizzes with students. Uh, I usually ask my students uh, to use the game. And then uh, I prepare some question uh, in, uh, for instance, Top Hat uh, or another survey. And uh, students that are in class can answer uh, immediately then using the app uh, or also can answer to me uh, after uh, the experience. So I use this app uh, as a way to introduce and to communicate with my students about the topic that I want to uh, teach. And uh, if I want to use this app as an assessment, you can do it, of course. I did not do it before. I just uh, asked them to play and to share uh, on a digital survey or top at the the score and their experience and their uh, uh, question about the game. Um, there was one other question uh, under the Q&A. As mm -hmm. an instructor, how do you recommend introducing students to a statistics course in order to ease their anxiety about the course, especially students who have math phobia? Any general specific tips, talking points to sort of address at the beginning? when you're dealing with that population of students? This is a very interesting question, especially today, because after the you know, COVID-19 crisis, uh, the situation, uh, the way the students uh, interact um, is um, with the instructor and with the, the topics that you introduce in class is very, very different from the past. However, uh, I believe that it's very important to, uh, to communicate with your student uh, and to be re really interested in uh, what they are feeling for the moment. Uh, and the use of this kind of uh, application is a way to try to drag the students that are not really interested in uh, or afraid of the topics uh, to this kind of topics. It's a way, it's not the final solution, but it's a way to help them to enter to the statistical risk or mathematical risk world. Um, and then there was another question about, um, can you, how many people can play the different games? At the this is time? based on a shiny server. Depends on the shiny server that you used. In this case, uh, the shiny server that, that I used is a shiny server that uh, is uh, the free to use shiny server. So 
there are some limitation, but uh, a lot of people can use it uh, simultaneously. In my case, uh, in my class were composed also by 100 different students that were uh, using it uh, together. Uh, did not, they did not have any problem at all. Um, it is possible to scale the number of users by modifying the setting of the shiny, uh, the shiny server uh, that we have. Okay. Um, there was also a question of just kind of general after playing the game, did you find that students were more motivated to learn math or running stats? Like in your this was the most important question that we wanted to answer uh, using this game. Uh, and in this case, we created a questionnaire with some question and the questionnaire were really positive about the fact that they were less afraid of student mathematics, uh, of, uh, less afraid of students mathematics than before. Okay. And also in the first experience with communication designer, the students uh, were required to create a data visualization uh, uh, project uh, also based on certain data analysis part. And we noticed that students that used uh, this kind of uh, games uh, to learn statistics uh, were uh, more and more interesting in statistics uh, and the number of projects that were also based on the topic that we introduced with these games uh, were a lot more than uh, the one that were created in the past uh, when uh, the statistical section did not uh, present uh, this kind of experience. So we noticed that students were more interesting, less afraid. Of course, uh, they were still afraid, the majority of them, but less afraid than before. And they were, um, they were ready to use uh, statistical reasoning or statistical techniques, uh, easy stuff, of course, uh, more than the past. A um, couple of technical questions. Mm -hmm. Is the Shiny source code available or are there license issues with yes, that? Yes, the Shiny source code is available. You can find it uh, on a GitHub, uh, on a GitHub that is uh, in the supplementary material of the paper. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can modify the, the Shiny app uh, as you like. Uh, you can change the, I don't know, the, the already up, up, uploaded uh, data. You can do whatever you want. Okay. And then someone is actually trying to play the game um, and they just had a question about how do you mm -hmm. get multiple dots on the graph for the, so you can only get one dot for k-means. Okay, so the, the K-means games uh, is, let me reload it because after some time you need to reload it. The, the, the K-means games uh, is this one point black revolution. So be sure that you are playing with point black revolution. There is another game that is point black 2D with allow only one dot. And in order to play the game, you need to click multiple time. If you are using an iPad, you just touch multiple time. And after doing that, for instance, I want four dots, one, two, three, four. You can see the position of the dots are here. You just press ready. And you she have the score. was using 2D, so that was the issue. She was in the other version of it. Yeah, okay. There is also another version of the point black that is the point black 3D. The point black 3D, however, being on 3D, did not allow the use of uh, touch uh, based uh, interaction, they just use slider, but it can be funny because it's 3D and sometimes 3D is exciting to students. All right, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It was very fun and interesting. All right. Um, and we will have a recording in the slides up on um, cause here in a little bit. And then as Jacopo said, if you look up his original article in the journal, there are some resources there for finding the games and, and finding the Chinese source code. But thank you. And I hope everyone has a very nice afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.